Okay, so I'm going to read from um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now, those of you with a good memory will remember this was the same passage I spoke on a couple of weeks ago. And I just wanted to revisit it again today, but from a different, different angle. And so I read the passage and then just say a few words about it. From verse 24 of chapter 1. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And that's not talking about the redemption that Christ has fulfilled. That's just talking about the job of preaching the gospel still needs to be done. And at times the church will be challenged and suffer for seeking to do that. He says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present you the word of God in all its fullness. And the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And it'll be this verse that I want to focus on a bit this morning. To this end our labour, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Just think about that verse again. To this end I labour, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I have been struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God doesn't always give up his deepest secrets easily. The basic gospel is there for all humanity to have. The wisdom of God is something we need to dig like a miner digs for precious jewels and gold. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Now I'm sure all of us here have realised that in life, not everybody always agrees with us, do they? We come across situations of many, many types where people have different opinions. And one thing I've always tried to teach Hannah and Joshua is to think very clearly when you say something about why you're saying it. Where you're coming from, just think about it. Think about what you're saying, why you're coming from it, why you think that, why you believe that, and so forth. And I say, sometimes you just need to be still. You need to listen, and then you need to act. And I had an interesting conversation with Hannah the other day. We watched the film Beauty and the Beast, and I didn't particularly enjoy it. I mean, it's a famous fairy town and all that. I watched the film, I thought, okay, yeah, that was an interesting take on it. But I thought it's an opportunity to challenge Hannah. So I said to her, well, I think Belle was suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. What do you think? And she was, I don't think that, Dad. And those of you who know what Stockholm Syndrome is, you know, where a kidnapped victim or hostage develops an empathetic bond with their kidnapper. And I said, she's kidnapped by this beast. I said, you can't deny the fact that she's been kidnapped by this beast and she's developed this bond. That is classic Stockholm Syndrome. She said, I disagree. And so I said, well, why do you disagree? Think about it. The point is that if we're not careful, so many Christians and churches can also suffer from a form of spiritual Stockholm Syndrome. You know, there's many examples of it in history, which I won't go into. But what I mean by that is this, that if we're not careful, we can be so changed or influenced by the values, ideas and influence of our age and culture that we cannot hear the voice of God, the voice of sanity and reason that basically we become victims of Stockholm Syndrome, that we become empathetic with all of the things that oppose the reason and the sanity of God. It's significant that the psalm in which the words be still occur is filled with noise and commotion. I read it earlier. It says the earth shakes, the waters roar, the mountains threaten to tumble into the sea, the nations rage, the kingdoms are moved, the sound of war is heard throughout the land. 
insanity. Everything seems to be crumbling. Everything seems to be collapsing. And I don't know about you whether or, it, or not it's just because we have constant access to the news and media, but the world seems to be going insane. We've got leaders talking about nuclear war. We've got uh, um, the Hollywood industry mired in scandals, Parliament and so many other industries. And they're just a few of the issues. There's so many issues upon issues we could look. Or actually, it just seems that everything is going insane. And sometimes when we look at it, we think, Lord, I don't want to get drawn into Stockholm Syndrome here. Give us the voice of sanity. Help me see clearly what is going on. And sometimes to do that, we need to be still, to listen and to act. Because in the midst of that tumultuous voice, the voice of sanity was heard. And it wasn't heard as a nervous and excited shouting and panic like, um, what's it, um, Corporal Jones from Dad's Army, running around, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. That's not the message of the church. We're not to run around saying, don't panic, don't panic. It simply is, in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that disaster, be still and know that I am God. And that just means just reconnecting with God, just listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying, just making sure that we're walking with him step by step. And that involves listening. And I think we as Christians, we must listen as much as we have ever needed to listen to our inner ear and the voice of God. I don't know about you, but I strive more than anything to try to see beyond the artificial world which is presented to us of selfish wants and needs. And as I was thinking about it this morning, I was thinking about when Satan once tried to bring about the downfall of Christ by offering him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Who wouldn't want that? Wealth, fame, riches, popularity, all of it offered on a plate. He, t- he saw through the illusion. He said, I'm not interested. He said, I'm only really interested in following what God offers. He saw in the world's glory, not what other people saw, the beauty, the fame, the fulfilment in seeing every desire met, but he saw a garish corruption that leads to death and deception that can only be purchased at the cost of the human soul. He basically knew its lures were a mere bait to catch foolish victims. Now, I believe, where is it? It's not often... I would quote uh, Russell Brand in a sermon. But um, I was looking at his book, Freedom from Addictions, because, especially as a naval chaplain, I would be speaking to people with addictions all the time, and it's good to try to understand the sort of like the psychology um, behind it. And he's quite a controversial comedian, but he's quite often insightful. You know, I like him because he sometimes just goes straight through the illusion and tries to hit at the truth. And this is what he writes in this book. And I've got it typed out, so I don't need to turn it, but it's on page 54 if anybody wants to to look at that. Not that I'm advertising the book. It's full of bad language and so forth. It might be a bit too raw for for some of your sensitivities. But um, just listen to this. He said, Having been poor... And now not being poor, I am in no rush to sprint down to the Kentish Town Dole office, bellowing, it's me again, can I have my pittance and desperation back? I say only this, I am famous and I know a lot of famous people and they are among some of the most discontent and lost people I have ever met. Boo hoo? Yes, boo hoo. But do acknowledge that nothing works as a salve for the pain that for simplicity's sake we shall call addiction. I bet from the swampy seat of your self-pity you would think that Prince, that's the artist who recently died of a drug overdose either this year or last year, was having a whale of a time or that George Michael was loving it. But I think it is safe to assume now they were not. They had got to the other side of their dreams and discovered, as with all illusions, there was nothing of substance there. And this is what he writes. Here is a postcard from the other side of fame. Luxury items and glamour are not real and cannot solve you. 
Whether it's a pair of shoes, a stream of orgies, a movie career or global adulation, they are all just passing clouds of imaginary pleasure. Isn't it interesting what Christ spoke about 2,000 years ago? Many celebrities who have all this fame are really discontented, happy people. They're saying it doesn't work. They're saying it really is an illusion. We could, I could quote actually probably about 10 or 20 you know, celebrities who've recently said something similar. Madonna, who just said, what's the point of all this? I may be a material girl, but I'm deeply unhappy with all the materialism my wealth has brought me. That's why she's looking into Kabbalah. They're looking for other means of spirituality. We could just quote again and again. George Michael, who you mentioned, said just before he died, he was questioning, what's the point of my life? What has been the point of my life? He was saying, a man who had global fame, records and wealth and so forth. You know, humility is to recognise one's relative insignificance in the big scheme of things. That's not worthlessness, but it's to recognise that we're valuable in the sight of God. And the trouble is, if we're only valuable in the sight of the world, because you're famous, because you're rich, because you have this, ultimately we see through the illusion of that, and we have a sense of worthlessness. Well, what's the point of all of this? But when we see what God says about us, that's when we can have true humility, that we're recognised that we're not worthless, but we do recognise in the big scheme of things, we're just one small cog in God's plan. And I think that is the true biblical humility that Christ teaches us to strive and to seek to become who God calls us to be and to seek to reach that potential. Because if we don't, we're no different than the person who is not bothered about higher things. As Jesus also said, the blind cannot lead the blind. So sometimes if we want to see through the illusions or we're being allured into things that we think, this will make me happy, this will fulfil me, sometimes we need to be still, to listen and then to act and ask God just to enable us to see through the illusion so that we can walk in tune with his Holy Spirit. Because the highest expression of the will of God in this age can only be found through the Christian church. The church can be found wherever God has gathered a few people who trust Christ for their salvation and who worship him in spirit and seek to live a meaningful life of discipleship dedicated to service and ministry, which we looked at in that passage a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't matter if we're not 100 people, 200 people. It doesn't matter if we do not have the aisles cramming with people wanting to get in here, yet we are still a church because we are people who gather, who recognise Christ's salvation, who want to worship God in spirit and who seek to live a meaningful life of discipleship dedicated to what he calls us to do. And that will bring growth in its own time. But not growth so our egos can be pumped up. Look, we've got a big church or whatever but growth so that more lives can be changed and that the kingdom of God can continue to perpetuate itself and grow. And so what we have to remember this morning, as us as the church here, we are all just one small part of something far bigger. As members of this congregation, be it minister, deacon or a member or just somebody in the congregation, we're part of a bigger collective, which is the collective of us as a church. As our whole collective, we're part of something much bigger, the church in this country, the church in the world, and so forth, and so forth. But what I want to say is that according to the scriptures, the church is the habitation of God through the Spirit. Listen to this. I want you to remember this as well as the other three points. This is not the era or the age of the absentee God. We as Christians are not living in an era or the age of the absentee God. History records that after the exile of Napoleon, the Bonaparte in France often lamented, if only the emperor was with us now. You see that with lots of great leaders when they're gone. You see people who followed them saying, if only they were with us now. What I find fantastic in the book of Acts and the epistles, you never see that. You never hear that cry, if only God were with us now. Is the exact opposite. God is with us. Christ is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. God in us. The, and, and so forth. It's incredible, isn't it? To think that it's not the era of the absentee church. It would have been perfectly natural if the early Christians had a wish that if only Jesus was still with us after they'd seen him crucified and resurrected and so forth and ascended to heaven. Especially during times of intense persecution or the theological questions they were soon to ask. The early church was a very, 
was a church very much similar to us today. Sometimes we have these naive impressions that it, oh, it must have been such a spiritual church, so perfect, so wonderful. No, you don't. You see people arguing. You see people failing like we failed today. You see theological questions. Well, what does this mean? And so forth. But one thing you never, ever see in the early church is that question, why is God not with us? It's always, he is with us. He's with us now. And that's what I want to encourage us with. I want to read another verse from Revelation 3.20 because there in that passage he mentions the Laodicean church and I think it's with good reason. I've heard many evangelists use this verse as an evangelistic message to somebody who's not a Christian and they'll say, Jesus said, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The interesting thing is, he's actually talking to a church there, that this church had locked him out. Maybe they believed in the era of the absentee God or whatever, but they'd locked him out and Jesus was, let me in, I will come in and fellowship with you and so forth. And the point of me saying this is, I actually do not consider myself a religious person. I actually don't like it when people say, oh, you're a religious person. If I have the opportunity, I try to correct them, because a religious person means basically somebody whose mind is just crammed full of doctrines and theologies. And yes, of course, as a minister, as Christians, we do have those things. But I am somebody who feels this divine energy of God working powerfully in my life. And you two, as Christians, you feel that. You sense this energy of the Holy Spirit. We feel this connection to God. And I'll say this, that I feel this divine energy working powerfully within me. But do you know mostly where it's changed, directed at? It's not like trying to direct the world. God's energy is mostly directed at trying to change me. Trying to help me to become the person he calls me to be. So that I could be more effective in what he calls me to do. And I use that as me because it's the same for you. Most of God's energy would actually be directed on you. On changing and challenging you. Not because, not because you're really bad people, but just because we all have areas where we need God to enable to, to perfect us. And that's what he also said in that passage, which I didn't read in um, the church of Laodicea. He said, those whom I love, I rebuke and I correct. So sometimes we need to be still to listen and to act. It's that third point I just focus on now. The advice you give to a person of faith is different to somebody with no faith. And by that I mean, especially when I was a chaplain, I would have several, eight people come through my office door in a day seeking advice on some trivial matters to some absolutely life-changing matters. If somebody was not a person of faith, it's no good to me to say to them, well, pray about this. Try to understand it from God's perspective, give them that sort of counsel, because they don't even believe in the God I'm telling them to pray to exists. So you use sort of like methods, you use um, you know, all of the sort of like the uh, trained counselling techniques and so forth. But actually, when a person would come in and they'd either reveal that you know, they was a Christian or a person of faith or whatever, or I knew they were, the advice you could give them was so much richer that you could talk about prayer, you could say, well, pray about this. Be still, listen to God, then act. Have faith, have hope, and so forth. Because all issues we face in life are either external, external challenges we have no control over, or external challenges we have some or complete control over. Guarantee every challenge you face at the moment will be something external outside of your control, or something external that you may have a degree of influence and control over. But there's also internal challenges that we may have no control over. Internal challenges that we may have some or complete control over. And sometimes the only advice we need is, Lord, help me to change. To be still, to listen, and then to act. And sometimes as Christians, that's some of the medication that can actually really heal and change our souls. Because according to the Bible, we have, because we ask, and we have not, because we ask not. And if you read the Bible and the teachings of Christ and the apostles, or any person who has been used by God throughout history, you learn 
certain things. Firstly, that God waits to display his power among his people. And that's what we see again in this verse and this passage. To this end, I struggle with all of his energy, which so powerfully works in me, works in him to change him, so that he, as God's servant, or she as God's vessel, can make a difference in the world. And so I close with these few thoughts. The prayer of faith is powerful and effective, but faith grows with use. If we want to grow in faith, we must use the little we already have and trust what God says. And sometimes it is just changing a different perspective. I was tempted the last week or two to become anxious about some of the issues we've had to, to face. And I had to remember the lessons I've had to learn through my own discipleship. Okay, be still. Seek to listen to God. Connect to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Let these human, human emotions or these spiritual powers that would seek to cause disruption, just be still. Speak to God. Talk to God. Ask him, Lord, help me to walk with your Holy Spirit. Show me the way. Lord, help me to hear your voice and just to speak to God. You know, praying to God isn't always a shopping list of, uh, you know, sort of like, um, Lord, do this. I want you to do this, do that, do this. If you don't do it, I'm going to sulk with you for the next six months. That's not prayer. You know, prayer is actually dialoguing with God. It's saying, as God says in the scriptures, he says, reason together with me. Speak to me. Talk to me. And says, close with these things. Faith and prayer are two sides of the same coin. They're inseparable. People often do pray without faith, but that is not true prayer. True prayer is not just giving God a to-do list, but true prayer changes our perspective. It helps us to start to see things, not from the illusion of this world, not from the illusion of the Stockholm Syndrome, but it helps us, like Christ, to see what is real and what is not. So be still, listen, act. Let us pray. Lord, quite often we do get caught up in the illusions of this world. We chase the fantasy of what we believe will make us happy. Sometimes when we catch it, Lord, we realise that it's just fool's gold and not the real thing. Lord, we all have needs. None of us want to live in financial need and desperation. Poverty is a great evil in your word, which you are against and which you have told us as your people to challenge and to, to change. But Lord, help us to realise, to place true value upon all things. Help us like Christ to realise, Lord, that the greatest thing that truly matters is understanding in the scheme of things who we are in you, how worthy you have made us, that true humility is not a sense of worthlessness, but it's just understanding that in this world we have a role and a place to fulfil. And yet it's a role which is always subservient to you, our God and our King. So Lord, help us to be still, to listen, then to act. In Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing a, a song, Jesus, we enthrone you, number 310.